through this, and hopefully it'll help explain this. We're going to use this basically as a um, kind of an introduction for where the rest of this, pre or this panel discussion is going to go. So like Matt asked, um, and you probably have seen this, you can have one electropharogram, one DNA profile, and get different results, both in the actual statistic reported and then also the wording that, of that statistic. There's a lot of different reasons for that, but you can get, you know, we've seen this, and there's a NIST study several years ago, there's actually been two NIST studies. You've probably seen this, where, you know, some labs are reporting one in a thousand, some people are reporting, you know, one in a quadrillion uh, from the exact same data. You also get different wordings for how that probability is uh, presented. What this comes down to, obviously, is the uh, statistical approach that's used. Uh, there's several different approaches that are out there. Uh, there's combined probability of inclusion, exclusion, CPI, CP, you've probably heard of that. Uh, this is historically what was uh, probably the most used in the United States. Uh, the U.S. and Europe kind of went two different directions at the beginning. Europe went more with likelihood ratios. Uh, the majority of the U.S. went with uh, CPI for mixtures. Uh, more recently, there's uh, for mixtures, uh, random match probability has been incorporated. Uh, there's likelihood ratios, both restricted and unrestricted, and then there's probabilistic genotyping. You've got semi-continuous and fully continuous methods there. So just from a single profile, you can use any one of these or all of these, and you can get a wide variety of answers from that. So probably wondering, you know, how can you look at the same data and get vastly different results? So the easiest way I could compare this to is if I'm driving home from the lab, I need a burger, it's Friday, I need a burger and a beer, I'm gonna to go to my favorite place, Dice Burger, it's kind of by my house, but I wanna see how long it is. I live in DC, traffic can range from 30 minutes to two hours, depending on what's going on. So if I wanna do a quick estimation of how long it's gonna take me to get from the, uh, my lab to Dice Burger, there's different ways I can do it, depending on what data I'm looking at. I can just do a measurement from, uh, as the crow would fly, from my lab to Dice Burger, and it's about 22 miles. That would take, you know, if I was driving six miles an hour, 22 minutes. Uh, obviously, that's not going to happen for many reasons. I could take the beltway around. Uh, if there's zero traffic, it's one in the morning, it may take about 32 minutes. And actually, that's, I work late for various reasons. Um, and that's when they always shut down the beltway. So even saying it's 32 miles on the beltway at one o'clock in the morning, it's usually the worst time to drive because they shut down four to five lanes. And then they have someone standing in the fifth lane. So it still isn't going to work for you. <laughs> Um, so that could still take two hours, but you know, if you just go with the rough estimate, 32 miles, 60 miles an hour on the beltway, 32 minutes. If I want to look, use more of the data that's out there, I can use my Google Maps, and I can say, hey, look, no traffic. I've never seen that beltway actually look like that. But so there I could assume, okay, it's going to be about 32 minutes, maybe a couple slowdowns may take a little longer. Or I can look at uh, kind of a rough estimation of the traffic, and this is more likely the case that's gonna take two to two and a half hours. You can also use you know, an average traffic of that time of day and get an approximation. You can use real-time data to get an approximation, but that's gonna change every time you do it, depending on where you're at in the situation. So all these are looking at the exact same distance from my lab to Diceberger. Obviously, you're gonna get you know, vastly different results from 30 minutes, 22 minutes, up to potentially two hours. And all this comes down to is what data are you using to make that calculation? How much of the data that's available are you using to make that calculation? All of them are legitimate, they're all valid, um, but it's just a matter of how much of uh, the available data you're using to make the approximation. So looking at those methods I just talked about, you've got CPI on the bottom left, combined probability of inclusion, does not use that much data. And to the right, you've got you know, basically the scale going, uh, how much of the amount of information you're using to make that uh, calculation. CPI, you're basically just using the alleles that are present. As you go up, uh, random match probability, you're making some assumptions as to the number of contributors, you're using peak height information, uh, you're looking at possible genotype combinations, you look at uh, likelihood ratio, both restricted and unrestricted. Uh, unrestricted, you're using uh, the peak information, or sorry, the allele information, but you're not really using peak height information, so you're really not gaining that much. Uh, but you are drawing some assumptions as to the number of contributors, potentially who's a contributor, and you're comparing two hypotheses. With restricted, likelihood ratio with restricted approach, 
Now you're using some of those peak heights and you're making, not only are you making assumptions on the number of contributors, possibly who's a contributor, but now you're uh, looking at peak height information, seeing what uh, alleles can possibly pair together. Then you get into probabilistic genotyping. Uh, this is fairly new on the scene. Uh, it's an application of forensics that's fairly new on the scene. Uh, the formulas, kind of the methods being used have been around for years um, in a general sense. Semi-continuous just means you're modeling some aspects of the data. Uh, in most cases, it's just the probability of dropout. But you're using more of the data, you're making assumptions as the number of contributors, possibly the, uh, who could be a contributor. And then you get into fully continuous probabilistic genotyping. Here you're modeling many more aspects of the data. So you're looking at, you're making assumptions as the number of contributors, you're potentially modeling peak height balance, stutter, uh, all sorts of uh, different aspects with the data. So that's the most sophisticated of all the methods that are being used out there. So all these different approaches really ask or answer different questions. Uh, CPI, you're asking what portion of the population could be a possible contributor to this mixture without assuming any number of contributors. So you could have two contributors, three contributors, four contributors, doesn't matter. You're saying what portion of the population could be a con uh, possible contributor to the mixture. So you're just splitting the population. A, you're a possible contributor. B, you're not. What percentage of the population fall into category A? Random match probability, similar, but now you're making an assumption as to the number of contributors, and that actually affects the stat uh, more than you would think. Likelihood ratio, you're looking at uh, comparing two hypotheses uh, and doing the ratio of those two hypotheses, making an assumption as to the number of contributors, and then forming the hypotheses that you're comparing. But even if you look at likelihood ratio, you can have variation within likelihood ratios, just based on the hypotheses that you're testing. So uh, you could have, say you have two suspects in a case. Uh, my lab may look at it and say, okay, I'm gonna just do each individual, individ or each uh, suspect individually. So I would have suspect one plus an unknown over two unknown individuals. Or another lab may do suspect one plus suspect two over uh, two unknown individuals. So just from that alone, you can get some variation in the result. So you can see every, every step we're going down this road, there's potential variation. It just really depends on what the lab's choosing and how they got there. The approach you use can actually affect the number of loci you're gonna use. So uh, if you have a CPI, combined probability of inclusion, and you're applying a stochastic threshold, in these instances, anytime you've got a peak below your stochastic threshold, you can't use that locus. So instead of being able to use this entire profile for like a random match probability or a likelihood ratio, now all of a sudden, there's only a few loci that you can use. And this is you know, a major part of how the stats can be different. Because for a likelihood ratio or random match, you may use all the loci that are present. But for the CPI, you're only gonna use those two loci. Obviously, if you assume about a, you know, an order of magnitude per uh, uh, locus, that's a pretty huge difference just there right off the bat. And just pointing this out, um, the arrows pointing there, you know, this was a known mixture we created. When you have thresholds, when you have these static thresholds, you develop these by looking at uh, lots and lots of data that you generate, and then you kind of uh, create these windows, uh, usually a three standard deviation window. It's just 99.7% of the pop, or 99.7% of the incidents would fall within this window. So that means 0.3% of the incidents are gonna fall outside that window and outside the expectations. And this is an example of that. Uh, here where, um, we think there's gonna be a uh, pairing there. Those uh, allele balancers, those allele pairings actually fall outside our expectations. And again, we looked at, I mean, these are hundreds and hundreds of uh, samples we looked at, but you see these differences uh, pop up now and then. So if you have these static thresholds with these ex expectations, and you know, like in our lab and most labs, you do your interpretation of the question evidence first, you may actually draw the wrong conclusion based on what uh, possible contributors you have there if you are making assumptions as to the number of contributors and using these static thresholds. So uh, that gets into the binary system, which we're gonna talk about in a second. So uh, you heard me talk about the continuous models, semi-continuous models, uh, binary method is kind of where we, we were. Uh, binary, it either falls in category or it doesn't. And so you make your calculation based on that. Continuous models uh, model some of these different aspects of uh, potential data or mixtures uh, with allele balance, stutter, dropout, et cetera. So if you look at a peak, and how many people know what a stochastic threshold is or have heard that? 
All right, so uh, just briefly, stochastic threshold, if you have an allelic peak, uh, I've seen electrophoric gram, you get this peak. That represent, uh, basically represent, represents the quantity of DNA that's present for that allele. In this case, uh, we're going to say the stochastic threshold is 200. That just means if you have a peak that is over 200 RFUs or 200 peak, uh, units for that peak height, you wouldn't expect any dropout occurring with that. So if you have a person that's an AB, if there's uh, a low-level sample, the A peak is over 200, you would expect to see that B peak. If it's below 200, you could have dropout, meaning you may not see that B, just because it's a low-level sample and it's uh, due to sampling issues and kind of the ugliness of biology. In a binary system, if you have a peak that's 198 or 199 RFUs, just below that stochastic threshold, the probability dropout for that is the same as if you have something that's at 51 RFUs, just above your analytical threshold. Now, realistically, and we know that, and just rationally, that obviously if something is right below that threshold, there's probably very little chance the dropout is associated with that. But at 51 RFU, uh, just above your analytical, way below your stochastic threshold, there's a pretty good chance that uh, dropout has occurred with that. In a binary method, there's no differentiation with that. It's either possibility or it's not. And it's, it's kind of funny. I mean, I came to this realization late in life that, you know, I grew up in the 90s thinking that, well, we're being conservative because we would say, okay, there's possible dropout. We're going to apply the 2P rule. That's great. We're being conservative because that's actually a much larger number than if we would just uh, do the actual possibilities of a pairing with A. But then you realize later on that it's only conservative if you assume that the suspect is the contributor of that DNA. Uh, otherwise, if I'm the defendant and I'm an AB and I see a peak at uh, 199 RFU where the probability of dropout is pretty close to zero, where I probably should have been excluded, now all of a sudden I'm included that, in that group as a possible contributor to the mixture. And that's, kind of, that's not as conservative as I would have liked to have been. And so that's where a lot of this is kind of moving is we're starting to model this and say, look, you know, we need to take that into account that if you are an AB and you've got a, you're only seeing a single peak that's at 199 RFU, maybe that's, you know, not as conservative to include that suspect in that grouping. So uh, here's a couple examples of uh, some data from a publication we did a couple years ago. Uh, Mike's on this as well. But we're looking at uh, four different statistical approaches looking at the exact same data. And across the bottom, I'm sorry, I'm just going to go over here for a second. We've got 100 peak grams, total input, 200 peak grams of DNA, total input, 300, 400, 500. This is a one-to-one -one mixture that we know what the, the results are. And you can see the different calculations, the results for the different calculations. Um, as you go higher, the, the number's higher. You can see with CPI at the lowest level, 100 peak grams, uh, basically couldn't use any of the data. You can see the green squares represent CPI that trends lower than RMP, which is kind of in the middle. It's a little bit of an improvement. Uh, you're getting a little bit higher numbers. And then you look at uh, lab retriever, which is a semi-continuous method, and star mix, which is a fully continuous method. Those two pretty much track together. So this is basically an indistinguishable mixture. Now you look at a three to one mixture. Again, you're looking at 100 peak grams, 200, 300, 400, 500 peak grams input. Again, CPI, Lowest one, obviously not as uh, discriminating. RMP and lab retriever, the semi-continuous method and RMP kind of track together. And then the fully continuous method, again, uh, kind of raises above, kind of distinguishes itself from the other methods. Again, this is all from the same data, and we're getting you know, huge orders of magnitude. We're going from 10 to the second to 10 to the 24th. I'm uh, oh, sorry, not quite that high, sorry. 10 to the 6th up to 10 to the 24th differences, looking at the exact same data. But it's all based on uh, the statistical approach you're using, what's being modeled, the information that's being used from that uh, data. So then the challenges. And this is what I've you know, been dealing with for most of my career at this point, uh, which method to use. Uh, you know, as a technical leader, you've got to make that decision. Uh, you probably, if, you, if your DNA lab's been open long enough, you probably started with CPI. At some point, you're going to have to make that transition over. How do you validate these new methods? You know, where most of us are probably, I'm a biochemist, I'm not a statistician, but how do you validate these new probabilistic genotyping software uh, methods? You know, we're used to validating kits, we're used to validating methods used in the laboratory, but validating a statistical software package is a whole different beast. Courtroom challenges. Uh, you know, this is a, 
biggest challenge is how do we convey this information to a jury correctly? You know, how you word a likelihood ratio is very different than how you word a CPI result or an RMP result. And then how do we convey that information to attorneys, both defense and prosecution? How do we train uh, DNA forensics uh, analysts? A lot of the you know, people that are forensic DNA analysts are biochemists, molecular biologists, biologists. We're not statisticians. We've had stats, but it's not a huge uh, part of what we've done in the past, uh, especially for the kind of the older people such as myself. Um, and then, like I said, trying to convey this information to juries, to prosecutors, defense attorneys in a meaningful way to make sure it's not getting convoluted in some way that doesn't make sense or it's being biased one way or the other. So the bottom line, um, if implemented correctly, I stress that part and we'll probably talk about that a little bit further, but if implemented correctly, all these methods are scientifically valid. Um, there are different ways of estimating that you know, significance of a DNA match. Each method used answers a slightly different question, that's, that's key. Likelihood ratios may be new to many jurisdictions. Uh, like I said, historically, U.S. was doing C, or going with CPI calculations, and now people are either transitioning using random match uh, probabilities as a stepping stone to some type of likelihood ratio. Some are going straight from CPI to likelihood ratios, either restricted, unrestricted, or right to probabilistic genotyping. Um, Others have been doing likelihood ratios for years since the beginning. Um, but I think at this point it's safe to say that most labs are in the transitioning process. So um, if you're in a jurisdiction that's in that transition, please work with them. Uh, you know, speaking from our laboratory, we can use any help we can, especially for the courtroom aspect. Uh, how do we better convey this and how do we make sure everybody in the uh, judicial system is aware of what's going on and how we can best serve the community. <coughs> 